Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Russ with rwgresearch.com. Today's date, let's see if I can get this right this time because I royally screwed it up last time. It is 6-1-2018. Cool, my wife's here, but I'm talking to you. So this video is going to be about uh, testing bifiler coil, a bifiler coil in this case, a really large one. 20,000 feet of wire, but really quickly, let me open this box and show you what's inside, okay? Mm, a box full of boxes. Hmm, step-up transformer. I don't think that's what's in it. That's what's in it. These things that are sticking to each other. Probably magnets, what do you think? <laughs> Let me open one. Okay, I got it out. I'll bring it somewhat close to the camera, but the focus on the camera is fixed. But anyway, these are the magnets that are going on the outside of the big shaft. So they fit on here, hopefully, just right. Look at that. So there's going to be 78 of those on here for the big motor. So anyway, Again, thank you, Richard. Richard has been basically funding this project because me and him are on a mission. So we're gonna build this thing. So 78 of these guys on there. All right, let's get on with the video. Just update for you. All right, so before we start, I'm gonna go over some basics. Uh, if you don't know any of these things, then I would highly recommend reviewing them on your own. Uh, there's plenty of places that you can just read about these things. I'm gonna go through them quickly, and I'm gonna go through them in a generic fashion, no fancy business, just generically the way most people view this stuff. Um, so really quickly, um, we're gonna be dealing with an inductance and a capacitance and the resistance of the wire, okay? Now, what I wanna just get across here is the fact that we're gonna be running an impedance curve, and the impedance is the AC resistance, or the opposition to change of current and voltage. So you've got basically no phase shift in a resistor. Pure resistance has a no phase shift in an AC circuit. If you have an inductor, you have a phase shift where voltage is leading current by 90 degrees. These, by the way, are ideal components. So realistically, it's normally less than that by a little bit because there's always some resistance in the circuit somewhere. Then here, capacitance, is current leads voltage by 90 degrees. Okay, so again, these are ideal components. So in a normal circuit, um, you have a capacitor and an inductor connected like this. All right, this would be like, uh, well, a tank circuit in this case. And the inductance and the capacitance work together at a particular frequency. These here would be two separate components in this case, but at a resonant frequency, you get a impedance curve that looks like this. Okay, so these are two individual components. Now what we want to look at is what happens inside a single coil that has a lot of internal capacitance and inductance. So ideally, our coil would react very similar to this with the um, capacitance between windings. However, when we wrap it in a bifiler fashion, we're going to have a little bit different, which I'll explain here. But what we're going to actually do is run a impedance. Um, I have a device. Um, I'll show you what it looks like. And basically it just sets up a frequency and sweeps it. And it determines um, how much current can get through it and also determines the phase shift. So on this side of this impedance curve, things act more like an inductor, and over here, they act more like a capacitor. So they call this um, inductive reactance and capacitive reactance, and it's reacting to the opposition of change. So that's frequency dependent, okay? So this peak right here for us is actually the self-resonant frequency, okay? So in a circuit very similar to this, you basically have an impedance, okay? Impedance is the AC resistance, usually ri written with the letter Z. So somewhere on this frequency, 
we're going to get a peak right here. And this peak is a high resistance. Okay, so internally, everything is oscillating back and forth, but from the outside, right, from this point to this point, as you're looking through, you'll actually have a situation where current does not want to get through there. Okay, so it has a high impedance. Now, this uh, self-resonant frequency, the other way to find this without a impedance analyzer is what I call the ring test. Okay, so if you just take a coil like this, all right, and you connect your, uh, let's say you connect your scope leads here, all right, that's the scope leads, all right, and then you take, I should probably do all that a little better, huh? You take your battery, you put a switch like this, and you just close the switch momentarily and let it go. What you're going to measure on the oscilloscope is you can see the voltage go up, and then you're going to see some oscillation. Okay, and this oscillation, if you measure between these two points, all right, like this, all the way across here, if you measure the time here, it'll be, uh, let's say in this case, it's uh, 1,000 hertz, okay? So we're going to use the oscilloscope like this and the impedance an analyzer like this to determine that we have what we are looking for. So the scope and the ring test is going to give us our self-resonant frequency. So internally, right, this is happening. It's an oscillation between the two components. And then on the impedance analyzer, it's basically the same thing, but it's actually measuring how much, you know, gets through there. I don't know the details of how it's actually measuring that, but that's the curve we're going to get. Now we're also going to get a phase, okay? So if this is the zero line, we're going to get a phase all right, so this is a zero, this is a hundred, and then uh, this is negative a hundred, and the curve will look something like that. And these two peaks, this one and this one, are going to match up in the frequency. Okay, kind of offset that. I should have drawn it, drawn it a little different there, so you can get a better visual. So it'll be like this. Okay, so anything in the uh, negative value of the phase shift is capacitive, and anything in the positive value is inductive. And your R LRC meters also do this. If you ever put a coil on an LRC meter and it's reading a negative value, if a meter is good enough, it's telling you that it's more capacitive than inductive at that frequency. Okay, so hopefully that's making sense to you. Really quickly, uh, I've got this diagram I drew up for myself, which shows the internal capacitance, the internal inductance. I don't have the resistance drawn here. I think that's in the frame, and you can see that. So I've got three versions here. So current leads voltage when it's more capacitive. Current is the same as the voltage. These are the phase angles, by the way. I should probably write that down. So that's the phase angle I'm talking about. All right, and then current lags, or I should say current is the same as voltage when it's a purely, uh, well, when uh, the inductive reactants and capacitive, capacitive and inductive reactants equal each other, it's purely resistive. That's when you get this resonant situation here. And then current lags the voltage whenever you have more inductance, okay? Um, it's kind of the opposite of what I said here, voltage leads current, and here I said current lags voltage. It's the same thing. So I just wrote it backwards, um, but it depends on how you want to view it. It's up to you. So this is, um, this is important because we want to see this phase shift, and that's what happens on this curve. Now my impedance analyzer only is good for a range of frequencies. I can't go real low unless I modify it. So I'm just going to go through, and I'm going to connect my big coil in this fashion. So we're going to be connecting one coil, then we're going to test it, and then we're going to piggyback series the next coil, and then the next coil, and all the coils will end up in series. And what we're going to do is we're going to plot, okay, this impedance curve according to adding more windings on a bifiler coil. Now this coil happens to be very large, so the frequency is pretty low. You can do this with any coil. Um, but most of the self-resonant frequencies of this ring test 
um, on generic standard regular coils is going to be pretty high because it doesn't have very much internal capacitance. So you might kind of ask me, like, why does it add a bunch of capacitance? And this is a just common standard way of thinking. But basically, if you see you've got 10 volts here, then you bring that, or sorry, 0 volts here and 50 volts here. So when you split it across the windings, you'll see that you have 100 volts and 10 volts split across these uh, equal resistances, basically, that are making up the inductors. So if you look here, between the 0 volts and the 10 volts, you have basically the insulation of the wire becomes your dielectric. And because you have a high potential difference between the two, you have a basically a capacitor. And then you add another one and another one and another one. And by the time you bunch these five wires in this case together, you actually have, you know, zero to 40 volts. Here you got 10 to 50 volts right up against each other. And that creates the capacitive action inside of this coil. So again, these are all common viewpoints here, nothing uh, crazy. Not talking about the dielectric field and all these other things. I'm just trying to throw the common knowledge at you so that whenever I actually do this on the bench, you'll know what I'm talking about. So let's go over to the bench. I'll show you the analyzer and we'll uh, get to work. And we'll plot all these out. And what I want to find out is I want to characterize the coil. I want to say every time I add one more winding in series as a bifiler coil, what happens? I've got 20 wires in this, in this coil, so I can do 20 filer in this case. And every time I add one, I want to see how much it changes the capacitance. Um, if we uh, are lucky, we could calculate the inductance, but I don't know if I'm going to do that because that's uh, more work that I may not do in this video. We'll see. So let's go over to the bench. I'll show you what I got. All right, here we are on the bench. My coil is here. I'll show you that in a second. Really quickly, I want to show you the impedance analyzer that I'm using. All right, so this is an analog device test board. This is like an evaluation board. It's about 60 bucks. It's a pretty cool kit. Um, it is a uh, EVAL, yes, an evil, AD5933EBZ. If you order this, I think if you order it directly from analog devices, it'll get to you faster. The other places have like a three week wait time or something, usually. But anyway, Probably all comes from, comes from the same place. So how this works is there is a calibration resistor that I put on this board. And I have my leads here. I probably should put better ones on here. But I have a calibration resistor. These are both 20,000 ohms at 1% uh, precision. So you basically set all the parameters, which I'll show you, calibrate this guy, and then uh, run the test to make sure it reads uh, 20K, 20,000 ohms and then you test your device. So let me show you. All right, recording a screen is never great, but here is the software. So in this case, uh, you just have to put in your sweep parameters. You can only do up to nine bits. So I started at 100 hertz. Uh, my delta between each uh, place I test is five hertz. But the cycle time is how many times it, it, it sits in one spot and tests. If you're doing low frequency, it takes forever. Um, then the clock frequency is the internal clock frequency here. And then there's a bunch of other parameters, and basically, I'm not going to go through all of them, but 2 volts peak to peak, resistor, 20,000 ohms, and then basically what we're going to do is we're just going to um, go here and hit program the device registers. That registers everything. I'm going to change this down to 10, and I'm going to put this at 20. I'm actually going to put this at... Uh, 750. All right, so I'm going to hit program, and then here I'm going to do a multi-point frequency calibration, and it will go through and it will it will basically calibrate for the parameters I put in. You have to do this every single time, and then I can go and measure the uh, internal temperature if I want. I like the uh, view theoretical calibration profile, but you don't have to. So with the calibration resistor on there, we're going to get a uh, go here to the Impedance curve first. So impedance curve, so 20,000 ohms, flat, perfect. Okay, we've gone from uh, our 750, just a little past 10,000 hertz. And if we look at the impedance, or the phase, I mean, the positive and the a a uh, negative, so more inductive up here, more capacitive in the lower half. So it's flat line, perfect. Now we can stick our coil on there and test it. I'm actually going to change this to go up a little higher in frequency 
Now when I put the first wire on there, I can't measure any peak. It's actually extremely high, and I don't even know if I can measure it on here. Alright, so as you can see there, I don't know if you're going to be able to read that. You might be able to read it. 22AWG. Uh, and yeah, 1,000 foot roll, 20 conductor, 22AWG. It is stranded wire. So that is the spool. It's a big boy. Um, I think it's around 85 pounds or something. So I've got it just terminated with some loose ones. I didn't have enough strips here. Right now they're all connected, but we will uh, change that up. Now, one of the things I'm going to do before we do any coil sweeping or anything on the oscilloscope, we'll do the ring test along with our pedance analyzer. But what I want to uh, show you is I'm actually going to connect the oscilloscope, right? So I'm going to actually take the probes of my oscilloscope and actually connect them across, in this case, the first wire because there's internal capacitance in these probes and I actually want them to be included in the test because I'm going to be testing them with the oscilloscope. I want to make sure that they match my impedance curve. So I will be testing with the oscilloscope probes attached. That's a differential probe, uh, 10 mega ohm, I think, resistor across those. I forgot what the capacitance is. All right, first things first. I'm going to run the test just like this. Um, I'm going to show you what it looks like on the screen. However, uh, it's really high of frequency for the self-resonant frequency with one wire, and so it doesn't show. But let me show you anyway. All right, as you can see, there is this little bit of mess right here. Um, the beginning of the curves are always a little screwy, and I also do not trust the actual resistance, or I should say impedance measurement here. I just use the graph as a, res a reference for frequency. I'm probably doing something wrong to get the, the, this correctly. i probably got to calibrate it with the resistance of the coil or something. So, um, the impedance curve shows that it's on the positive side the entire time. As you can see here, this is the degree angle in positive and the degree angle in negative. And again, that is the current and voltage uh, lagging or leading. That's what this phase angle is talking about. So, yeah, nothing. So now we're going to connect the first one and we're going to see what it looks like. Alrighty, so there you go. Uh, we have run the first test. Again, this right here, this... Uh, I don't know, I don't really trust what that's actually saying, but at least does give you an idea of what's going on. So, uh, the frequency, right at about 8 kilohertz, 8,000 hertz. So, again, that's that self-resonant frequency peak. Let's go and look at what the phase angle looks like. Looks like the zero crossing point is exactly in the same point. So those two match, that's a good thing. So it is inductive through this region until it gets about 8 kilohertz, then it turns into a capacitive reactance. So inductive reactance over here, capacitive reactance over here. This chart also agrees. And if we do the ring test, it will also agree. So let's go ahead and set that up and see if it works. Real quickly, um, one other thing we can tell by this graph is we can tell the Q of the coil, which I'm not going to discuss, but we can actually use the ring test and this graph to tell us what the Q of the coil is. Uh, you can look that up for yourself. We're not going to do that here, but just thought I'd mention it. All right, messy bench, but here is what the ring test looks like. So I've removed the impedance analyzer because we don't want that connected because when this rings, it's a pretty high voltage. Um, again, it's that uh, inertia slamming to a stop in the coil. So we've got the negative connected to the negative, right? So the red wire goes in, comes back out, this is the first bifiler. It goes back into the wire next to it, and it comes back out. So basically, we're measuring across the outside of the two coils. I'm just going to hold it on there for a second and then release it. And we're going to check the oscilloscope shot and see how that looks. Okay, hopefully everything stays in focus. Let's see if we can capture this. Here we go. Oh, try again. I hit it too many times there. Okay, so I have only 12 volt battery, but I wanted to capture this very large ring. So let's uh, basically zoom in. Uh, we'll go to the beginning just so you can see how the, the voltage stepped up there. And then we're going to go over here to this ring and we're going to measure it. Aha, there it is. 
So this oscillation right here, this is actually a spark, and then, then the oscillation starts. So we're going to measure between, see if I can go in even closer. We're going to measure at the zero crossing of one, out right there. We're going to go one complete cycle into about the same spot. And you can see the delta there is exactly 8 kilohertz, or just a fraction over. And uh, so that matches our impedance analyzer. So our impedance analyzer is doing a good job. And our ring test confirms both of our test, test methods are good. So now we're just going to keep doing the next winding, and the next winding, and the next winding, and the next winding. And then we'll plot that data. All right, so for our starting reference point, this is a single coil. So I could not get the impedance analyzer to read it very well, so I did the ring test. And you can see that one cycle is roughly 75 kilohertz. So ideally, you could actually measure more than one, divide by however many you measure, however many cycles. But this is, this is OK, because I can really see where my cursors are at. So 75 kilohertz for a single winding with, uh, with all this stuff going on. That's, that's still pretty low considering, but that's a pretty big coil. All right, we've now added another coil. Let's see what the impedance analyzer shows. We went from 75 kilohertz to 8 kilohertz. Let's see what the next one is. Okay, so there is our data. Now I will rescale this and uh, get a, a more accurate measurement later, but the ring test seems to be uh, verifying that this thing's working well. So you could just use the ring test. You don't really need an impedance analyzer. However, this is really nice because it does show the phase shift. Uh, we'll actually test this as well. We'll actually do a scan on the oscilloscope and we'll actually be able to measure this. But uh, you can see how this is uh, capacitive reactance, inductive reactance, and same thing here. So we went from uh, 75 kilohertz to 8 kilohertz to, uh, what is that, about 5, 5 kilohertz, no, uh, I can't even see what that is, 4, uh, it's hard to tell without a, a better graph here, okay, let's see what the ring test shows us, and then uh, I'll get all these done so you don't have to sit here and watch, because that's boring, okay, well, we're back to this mess, um, so I've got them all not touching and all connected in series, so now what I'm going to do is uh, briefly show you what the chart looks like, and then we're going to do an experiment to verify the phase shift is actually at the right spot according to our measurements. So let's go. Alrighty, as you can see here, these are our wires connected in series. Here's our frequency. So 75 kilohertz kind of jumps down to about uh, 1,000 hertz here. And uh, yeah, we get all the way down to about 277. So there it is. Now, what I'm going to, I'll plot this later. I might throw it on the, the screen here. I don't know if I'll talk about it, but we'll plot this data against uh, the frequency and the uh, show exactly how this is connected with each wire. So, yeah. Now, what I'm going to show you right now is basically this circuit. So we've done this in the past. This is a, a way to actually determine the inductance of the coil, and then we can actually calculate the capacitance. I'm not going to do that here, probably, but you basically have the signal generator, then you have a yellow probe across the signal generator, then you have your inductor, your resistor as a load, and then your, uh, that goes back to ground, and then basically a second probe here, and you're looking at the phase difference between these two. Okay, and the by having a resistor here, an inductor here, we can actually see what the phase difference is. So let's go ahead and determine if with all the wires connected that we get a phase angle shift right here at the 277-ish hertz mark. Uh, basically, this is a giant mess, but you can see I have the resistor there, the signal generator is here, and then it's running over there and connecting to the coil. Alrighty then, so here we are. You can see I've got the uh, two signals set up. Um, so I basically have the phase angles here as well, so you can see them on the screen. Uh, the yellow is considered the voltage, and the purple is across the resistor considered the current. So you can see which one gets through the coil first, and which one gets through the coil second. 
In this case, our yellow trace, the voltage is leading the current. We're at about 200 hertz, just shy of 200 hertz. So we're looking for frequency around 277 hertz. We should see a phase change. So let's see if that's true. We're just going to slowly sweep. And you can see right about there, we're in phase. Let's keep going to the capacitive reactance mode. And so about there, so we're about 100 hertz past, or we went from uh, 200 to 400, I should say, and they flipped. Okay, so now we're exactly the opposite phase angles. So let's do this. Let's go back to about here. Let's get this trace a little bigger. The this reading is uh, not always accurate because it's picking up these little spikes. Uh, the way you can fix that is if you go in here and change the sample mode to average, and then you get a much smoother signal kind of cuts out all the noise, but it is slower in response. But if we look here, these are pretty well in phase. I might be able to adjust it a fraction. But realistically, it's pretty close. 278, 277 hertz, which is exactly what we've got written on our chart. So yes, indeed, these do hold true. So I'm actually going to go back and turn the average back to sample. So it's a little faster on its update. So yeah, so here we're at a lower frequency. Voltage is leading current. Voltage then the current. Remember, the, it's going that way on the screen. So time, it's going that way. So yeah, switch it up. So it's perfectly matching our measurements on the phase shift. One of the other things to note is that when I connected these wires, I tried to find the wire that was right next to it, not just randomly to try to create that uh, inner winding capacitance. Um, so yeah, there you go. So I plotted the data. Um, I put that first point on here so you can't really see what's going on. So what I'm going to do is just remove the first one. Just remember it's much higher than the rest of these. So one wire. Um, which is actually the one I just took off, up to 19. So actually this is 2 through uh, 20, basically. Uh, but you can see how the curve looks here, and it kind of goes down. Um, and the other thing I did was I also, let me show you here, I did the calculations for the inductance and the capacitance. So with this rough calculation, you set up the same circuit I showed you. And then you measure a frequency um, or a phase shift of 45 degrees. Then you do uh, R divided by 2 times pi times the frequency. So the resistance of the uh, load here and the coil. And you come up with about 9.89 Henry. And somewhere roughly around 33 nanofarad according to the self-resonant frequency to do the calculation for this. Now whether these numbers are actually that accurate I don't know but I did it so there you go okay well welcome back to the whiteboard um, I hope you learned something because uh, this was just one of those things I wanted to go through I wanted to find out kind of what happens when you start adding these in by filer um, it looks like the more and more and more you add depending on how they're configured now in this case uh, you know I got a pretty big insulation between the windings where you have a lot of uh, higher or a lot um, less capacitance I should say when the wires are closer together you should have more capacitance uh, just depending on the parameters and the plastics and the coatings and everything but ideally that's kind of the situation so here um, every time we add something you can see how the curve looks um, and at a certain point you know the first one was a huge drop the second one was a pretty big drop and then they slowly uh, don't change much after that but they do change so one of the questions um, that I had myself was when you have two wires um, running side by side and they're connected in series in this bifiler fashion or if they're connected in parallel, okay, so instead of these blue lines being connected like this, I would actually just connect the end terminals, right, and come out basically like this. Um, so what I wanted to know 
was when you connect things like this, what happens to the inductive uh, situation, the capacitance, the inductance, and, so, and, and stuff like that. And so for that, I set up this, okay? And this is basically, um, this right here is a Litz wire. They're wrapped in purple. Let's see if I can get it to focus. And here is the equivalent wire diameter. So the amount of wire here versus here, this is a solid wire. This is actually 100 strands of number 46. So I just wanted to confirm that the capacitance of the parallel stranded wire versus the solid wire was the same, and it is. So the capacitive reactance, the inductive reactance, nothing really changes here. But when you get into high frequency, you start talking about skin depth and uh, the uh, skin effect, and that is whenever those things start to change a little bit. But for the lower frequency stuff, it doesn't really matter. Um, these are identical. So yeah, just a little reference piece there in case you were wondering. Um, a bunch of wires in parallel, same diameter, same amount of copper mass, doesn't really change much at all but the skin depth is affected in this case. So anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day, and uh, God bless you guys. Read the Bible more, and I'll talk to you later. You got anything to say? I'm hungry. She's hungry. I am actually hungry. I don't think I ate much dinner, and it's currently 11 o'clock. What time do we start? 9 o'clock, probably. So anyway, thanks for watching. Hope you learned something. Leave me a comment. See ya.